of the, the C6 seminar series. Uh, I work at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and I'm very excited to welcome you to our sixth seminar in the C6 seminar series, which is on polypharmacy. We're very excited to welcome you to the seminar series. For those of you who've never joined before, this is a series on the clinical care of children with neurodisability and medical complexity. C6 stands for Collaborative Conversations with Families to Advance uh, the Clinical Care of Children with Medical Complexities and Disabilities. It's a 10-part seminar series that is supported by the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health in partnership with Family Voices. We're really excited for everyone who's joining today and look forward to your participation and engagement throughout today's seminar on polypharmacy. We want to acknowledge that each healthcare encounter is unique be it brief or lengthy, and that many of the topics in this series are difficult to address by virtue of the fact that we're addressing gaps in research affecting clinical care. And while we cannot cover the breadth of, of this topic, we aim to at least highlight the cooperative need and value of partnership in moving uh, our understanding forward. A few reminders, please remember, if you have any questions and comments, we have a Q&A box. And once we've concluded our formal presentations, we'll move on to a panel discussion We'll try to get to as many questions and comments as possible. Uh, and after the seminar, you'll be asked to complete an evaluation survey, we, which we use uh, to get some feedback about the seminar um, that helps us plan for future seminars. We, we ask you to complete this evaluation by Monday, March 21st, in order to be able to also process CME credits for today's seminar. You'll receive details on how to claim your credits by email. Based on the rich discussion, past sessions. We are adding 30 minutes to the conversation. Attendees are invited to stay for a virtual coffee chat from 2 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the seminar will be one hour long and we'll have a 30-minute session afterwards. If you can't stay, the cafe Q&A will be recorded and you can view it at any time. Our aim of this seminar is to create a series that's supportive and safe space to have these discussions that ultimately help to improve clinical care. And to do this appropriately, we have partnered with families throughout the series because family participation is essential to improve clinical care. Families are clinical partners in care 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and their experiences and perspectives matter. They matter a lot. However, by virtue of this forum being large, virtual, and the nature of these kinds of discussions, which often involve lived experiences that may resurface a variety of different reactions in individuals, we understand that these conversations may be difficult. If anyone needs support after attending these sessions, we invite them to reach out. These links will be shared with you. We have links available for physicians and clinicians, uh, for a person uh, who experiences medical complexity or disability, and for family givers that will be put in the box. We are really honored today uh, to introduce our two family leaders, Casey Dudley and Sarah Carlson. I'm going to begin by introducing Casey. Casey is a wife, mother, and caregiver who has also become a trusted advocate and community leader. She is the project director of the Parent as Champions Project at Span Advocacy and holds a degree in marketing and advertising. She's a trained professional in support coordination for the New Jersey Division of Developmental Disabilities. Casey is also a licensed um, uh, clinical massage therapist who specializes in infant massage and sensory integration for children and adolescents um, on the autism spectrum. Casey has demonstrated steady leadership in serving families in underserviced communities and for children with disabilities. Weighing only two pounds and two ounces, her son was one of the first children to be exclusively breastfed in the NICU as a result of her advocacy. Casey, thank you for joining us today. And I was wondering if you can share an experience or experiences that you have in regards to polypharmacy that are illustrative of what this topic means to you and your family. And please, can you also share with us what you see as implications for change? Sure. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hi, everybody. And I appreciate the warm welcome. And thank you for having me to be involved in this, <clears throat> in this seminar. Um, so as you see here, there are pictures of my family. Um, I have gone through, you know, ups and downs when it comes to polypharmacy, as well as being a, the, you know, 
caregiver of two individuals that completely, completely need my undivided attention. Um, and I am the mother of Elias, who is a nine-year-old fourth grader now. And I'm also the sister of uh, Brenda, Brenda Liss, and she is 32 years old now. Um, the picture in the middle you see um, is a picture of myself, my mom, and my little sister. <clears throat> Brenda was um, adopted when, um, oh gosh, I think it was back in 2008, and she was um, with my mother in Florida. And at the time, my mom, uh, we did not know unexpectedly, would pass away from colon cancer. And during that time, when I came to take care of her, she tasked me with the responsibility to take care of my sister. Um, who I knew nothing about, right, when it came to supporting someone with so many health, special health care needs. Um, Brenda has a developmental delay, um, and she had also has underlying diagnoses of mental health. She has bipolar disorder. Um, she has um, PTSD, and along with several other diagnoses for mental health. Um, and I didn't know the bag that came along with those diagnoses, right, when it came to things such as polypharmacy and how it would affect my life every day. Um, if we fast forward from 2009 to 2012, um, I was blessed with having a child who you see in the upper right. That is my son, Elias. He is, um, he was born at 26 weeks um, at two pounds and two, excuse me, one pound and uh, two ounces. Um, you know, he was a micro preemie, so you can only imagine um, the different medications and services. And, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I can't even tell you the long list, laundry list of medications that he had uh, being in, that, in the NICU. Um, you know, you would ironically think, you know, normally or naturally that, you know, my son would be the one that would be affected the most when it came to those um, different services and needed medication and working with doctors. He was diagnosed with autism at uh, 15 months. However, he thrived. He did very well. Um, and, you know, while we managed, um, you know, several <clears throat> medications with him, so, you know, and when it came to his digestion, we, you know, Regulin, and then he had issues with uh, breathing. So we had to have him on steroids. But after he, you know, developed outside of the NICU, he was fine. It was my sister that I did not realize who would need the majority of the support as she got older. Um, Brenda Liss, who is now 32, um, she is, you know, a great individual, but she does have significant care that is needed. And that comes with a lot of monitoring of medication. As we do know, once um, individuals begin to get older, um, you know, things start to happen. Um, things change. We need to change up medication. Um, and then sometimes they fall apart. Some days she doesn't want to take her medication. The list starts with Seroquel, Trazodone, Abilify, Topamax. Um, she also has acid reflux that she has to take due to the some of the medications, you know, eating away at the lining of her stomach for her taking too much at one time when she wasn't supposed to. Um, she also has um, asthma, well, so she's also on steroids as well. Um, as you see, she's also um, a part of Special Olympics, so we have to ensure that she has the appropriate medication when she um, when she's out playing her uh, her sports. However, when these medications are not taken, it spirals down into um, sometimes where she goes into manic episodes, right? Um, and then they turn into a um, a hospital stay, and that's where things get really really tricky, right? So you know hospitals from what I have found while the support is needed and it could be a situation where she absolutely needs to be there um, things happen along the protocol in the hospital right so if she's out of touch if she's not doing what she needs to do um, there's a PRN so she's going to get an injection um, and the medication that she's prescribed sometimes they're not even taken into consider consideration she may be given lunch or she may be given a meal that doesn't you know, coincide with what she can or cannot eat. Um, and that then again throws some things off. So now we're spiraling even more out of control than what we were when we first got there. Um, and so managing this can be very, very, um, it can be very challenging. Um, and I find that it is about having a team, a team of professionals that are there 
that are going to be there to support the individual, listen to the family, and understand that they are an equal part at the table when making decisions and understand what we need to do to get that individual back to stability and ensure they're stable. I'm now working with a team, um, and these are one of the things that I feel is necessary that we need to look more into to move forward into more of a positive result, um, and to especially young adults when transitioning um, into this process. And I think we need to ensure that we have find, we find a team of professionals that are going to organically look at the individual and what he or she needs for their individualized care. Um, this is not a situation where it's a puzzle and everyone is just gonna fit inside of a piece um, or every piece is gonna fit for that individual, I should say. We need to make sure that that individual is someone that we are looking at to find out what they actually need for their support. So, so in, a, in conjunction of medications, they also need therapeutic services, counseling services, and we need to make sure that we're working together as a team. This last year, we have had several hospital stays, and they have resulted not in a positive nature, all because of not following what is actually happening or what she needs or not following the list of services and medication that she has on a daily basis. So then it takes us into a whole new list of medications that we she's been on while in the hospital and bringing her back to what she actually has been prescribed and what has been working. Um, so mental health in this situation, I know it's not one of the things that you tend to think of when we talk about polypharmacy, but it's very, very relevant. Um, and this is something that has been on the forefront for a very, very long time, just not constantly spoken about, but it's something that we really need to start to um, you know, bring more to the forefront to support families in this situation. Thank you, Casey. Um, I'm now going to pass on to uh, Sarah and introduce Sarah. Sarah is a mother of a child with multiple severe disabilities, and this has permanently changed the lens in which she sees the world. It has also influenced the professional roles that she holds. Sarah directs four ICF homes supporting 24 adults with severe disabilities. She also serves as a family consultant for Family Voices of North Dakota an experienced parent for early intervention, infant development services for children and family. She has served as chair for North Dakota's intra-agency coordinating councils for multiple terms and holds many other leadership roles in her community at the state and on a national level. Sarah navigates the complex world of rural health care and services for her own family and for many other families in Western North Dakota. So Sarah, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Can you share with us an experience uh, or experiences that you've had raising a child with medical complexity and polypharmacy that are illustrative of what that means for you and your family. And can you please also share with us what you see as the implications for change? Thank you so much, Ayal. I'm excited to share our perspective on how polypharmacy both supports and challenges our lives. I'm gonna share some photos at the end, but I'm gonna be talking a lot today about our son Beckett. Beckett is nine years old and is a bright, loving, happy boy who loves adventure, folk music, animals, and reading books. Beckett was also premature, like Casey's story, and was 11 weeks and had a uh, premature and had a brain bleed at birth, which caused several disabilities, including spastic, quadriplegic, cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, seizure disorder, and cortical visual impairment. Beckett takes 11 prescribed medications and 18 supplements and over-the-counter meds to support his overall health. Most of Beckett's meds address his high tone, seizure disorder, and gastrointestinal health. Beckett sees many different specialists, all who play an important role within the play of his life, but it's also important that each actor in this play doesn't only fo focus on their monologues. They must also master the chorus lines together. Our primary care provider, Beckett's pediatrician, plays a leading role within our life as it relates to managing medications. Even if he doesn't prescribe the medications, he lends support with communication to the pharmacy, to specialists and reviewing that list. That review of the list needs to be more than just a clerical effort done by the nurse who takes Beckett's vitals at the beginning of the appointment. We have also prioritized building relationship with our pharmacists. 
We know them by name, they know us by name. This has helped us when manufacturing challenges limit the supply of medications. The pharmacist calls to let us know when a limited supply of a med comes in after they've spent time on their time searching for alternatives when there are manufacturer limitations. They also support us with smaller storage bottles when we need them for travel. They know what meds Beckett needs on a routine basis, so they're sure to stock them because it may be two or three days before the delivery truck gets to rural North Dakota with the next shipment of meds. I'm gonna show you a photo of what four days of medication looks like as we prepare for our 500 mile trip to see many of Beckett's specialists. Beckett uses medications in tablet and liquid form, so dosing ahead of time is helpful when we spend at least 10 hours in the vehicle to get to our destination. We're careful not to travel with large quantities of medications for theft prevention, but this is a challenge when some of the medications have a short shelf life. We can't always dispense into a smaller bottle. We make sure there's a refrigerator in the hotel room for storage of some of his meds as well. We also have to consider not leaving the medications in the vehicle because of either sub-zero or hot temperatures, not wanting our meds to freeze or get too hot. We need to consider the medications that are sensitive to light and need to be stored or dispensed into amber syringes versus clear ones so that the efficacy of the med is not compromised in Beckett's life. We use different colored caps to signify different meds and divide them out all out into labeled baggies that signal the date and time of day. When medications are reviewed upon admission to the hospital, we always have a current list of medications with us. Leaving something off like the hydrocortisone cream that goes on the bottom of Beckett's foot may seem unimportant stacked against the five seizure meds. But when Beckett starts to wiggle and show discomfort in his legs, I can easily rule out itching from his dishydrotic eczema on his foot with this cream. The biggest challenge that we face as parents is some of the clinical decisions that we are sometimes challenged with making in Beckett's everyday life. Beckett's main concerns are within the same nervous system, seizure control and spasticity. There's a period of time that Beckett was experiencing painful frequent spasms that were causing his joints to dislocate. So we were using diazepam on a routine basis, which was doing a great job of minimizing those painful spasms. But when the dislocated joints were addressed through surgical intervention and we were weaning off of that med, no surprise, we started to see an increase in seizures. Our neurologist and physiatrist had to have great communication with each other to create a plan that would support Beckett in both arenas. These two areas are our constant battle. When Beckett has seizures, he's postictal for a period of time and then his high tone kicks in. So we use as needed diazepam to address his tone, but sometimes high tone and pain can trigger a seizure. So sometimes the diazepam is used ahead of time as a prevention tool. When Beckett is ill, his seizure threshold also lowers. So we use this medication along with fever reducing medication to increase his seizure threshold. These are the kinds of decisions that we're faced with. They are physician level decisions on the use of his medications to support his health. At the end of the day, we appreciate any attention and support in Beckett's life so that we can get back to the big picture. I'm gonna show you what that big picture looks like. It's Beckett using an adapted sled to enjoy the fluffy snow. We want our healthcare team to help Beckett achieve his goals. So here's some photos of our family. And then the next one is of Beckett. And then I'm gonna show a photo of what four days of meds looks like. So all in their individual baggies and prepped. And then the last photo, the big picture. We want our healthcare team to help Beckett achieve his goals. When I think about goals as it relates to medication, of course I want the least amount of medications in Beckett's life. But just like when I'm asked about other goals in Beckett's life, I worry that if I say that I wish Beckett could walk, I wish Beckett could talk and see. I wish that he didn't have so many meds. I worry that when I say these things, 
I'm also whispering that I wish I didn't have a child that cannot walk, talk, see, or need so many meds. I feel this is what our practitioners are expecting to hear, but do I spend too much time, energy, and resources on only addressing his deficits? The thing is, I have no intentions on fixing Beckett. He is not broken. So instead, I say that our goals are that Beckett becomes a Nobel Prize winner, that he invents adaptive equipment to help ease the struggle for people like him who use wheeled mobility, have easier access in the world. Maybe he can be a part of problem solving, the world of medications, <laughs> that he works together with his healthcare team to select and give genuine care to all things that he puts in his body. I wish that Beckett has true friendships, that he's included in work, school, play, and relationships. Because the thing is, it's not just about keeping Beckett alive. It's also about living. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Casey, for um, such important, inspiring, and anchoring um, perspectives on the topic that we're going to talk about today. When we designed the seminar, talk about any issues in complex care to incorporate multiple disciplines and uh, expertise in place. And clearly, um, the, the, the perspectives of the expertise of parents and caregivers is, is critical to all of these discussions. So uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, and I'm now going to introduce uh, our next two speakers who bring different disciplinary perspectives, um, Dr. James Feinstein and Dr. Lucas Orth, who are going to um, provide a presentation on polypharmacy uh, before our discussion. And um, I've noticed some really rich comments in the chat box, and please keep them coming. Uh, if, if there's specifically questions, uh, because we'd like to also begin to introduce um, questions for our discussion afterwards, please use the Q&A. Um, um, function in Zoom. Uh, so the first presenter is going to be Dr. James Feinstein, who's an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, where he practices uh, as a primary care physician in focus on children with medical complexity, neurologic impairment, um, with a focus on pediatric polypharmacy. His long-term research goal uh, which I think will resonate with everybody attending today is to improve medications. Implementing and evaluating patient-centric strategies to optimize the way we manage uh, our pediatric patients who are on many medications. Our second speaker is Dr. Luke, who's an assistant professor of pediatric pharmacy at the University of Colorado SCAC School of Pharmacy in Denver, Colorado. Uh, so he's going to bring to us another really critical perspective, the pharmacy perspective. He practices as an embedded pharmacist within the special care clinic at Children's Hospital in Colorado. He works collaboratively with providers, other, dis other multidisciplinary staff to help provide pharmacotherapy recommendations, education to patient, parents and caregivers and patients, and other medication-related assistance uh, to patients and their families. His current clinical research focus is on medication therapy management, polypharmacy, and expansion of pharmacy services to children with medical complexity. So we really look forward to your presentation and uh, pass over to you, uh, Dr. Feinstein. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. Um, Luke, uh, Dr. Orth and I are gonna present together. So uh, we will kind of bounce back and forth between slides. Um, I'm gonna pull those up right now and we'll get started. But thanks for the introductions. So we will get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Orth and I are very excited to present this talk called Outpatient Polypharmacy in Children with Neurodisability and Medical Complexity. And we were going to introduce ourselves here, but we'll forego it because uh, Dr. Cohen just did such a great job. So we'll get right into it. My single disclosure is that my research is supported by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. I do not have any other conflicts of interest to disclose today. 
Dr. Orth does not have any conflicts of interest to disclose either. And we'll just put up the accreditation slide once more um, that was posted at the beginning of the talk. And these are the details for today's uh, CME requirements. So let's get right into it. Our objectives for the next 25 minutes are that first, we would like to describe the characteristics of polypharmacy in children with neurodisability and medical complexity. Who gets polypharmacy? What does it look like? Two, the second objective is to recognize the types of problems that can occur due to polypharmacy. And then three, we'd like to demonstrate through several examples how we might go about managing and reducing polypharmacy. For the purposes of this talk, I'd like to provide a few definitions right up front. When we refer to polypharmacy, we will be talking about children who use five or more medications at once. An adverse drug event or an ADE is any harm or consequence that is due to the exposure to a medication. And then finally, a drug-drug interaction or a DDI is a known or a theoretical interaction between two medications where one medication may influence how the other behaves and can sometimes lead to problems. So first I'd like to provide a brief overview of the medication system and we'll frame the rest of the talk around aspects of this medication prescribing cascade. So it all starts with a clinical interaction between a patient, the parent and the clinician which leads to a decision to start a certain medication. Once that medication is ordered, it's entered and transmitted and then processed by a pharmacy and then dispensed by the pharmacy to the parent. In the home setting, much like Casey and Sarah described, the parents will then administer the medications. And ideally, there is some type of a monitoring plan in place between the parents and the clinicians such that we know whether the medication is doing its job or causing new and unwanted problems. And this cycle can happen repeatedly until the right dose is achieved or a different medication is indicated. Now, where things become really tricky is when you think about children, for example, like Beckett, who use multiple medications at once. For example, this patient has 23 different medications on their current medication list. And on the left side here, highlighted by the red arrows, you can see that each of the higher risk medications this child takes affect the central nervous system, like opioid pain medications and anti-seizure medications. On the right side, highlighted by these purple arrows, we've identified all the different types of formulations that this child's parent must administer at home, ranging from liquids to capsules to powders or other topical medications. You can see very quickly that when we think about the medication prescribing system multiplied across 23 different medications, each with their own specific administration instructions, this can become very complex very quickly for both parents and for clinicians. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Orth here. Thank you, Dr. Feinstein. On top of the intricacies of the medication use process, which can expand quickly in the setting of polypharmacy, um, there are a few additional complications that we know can introduce added risks to pediatric medication use. Uh, probably the most prominent is that we are very limited in pediatric medicine by the lack of high quality drug trials for many of the medications used on a daily basis. Of the several thousand medications that are approved for use in North America, fewer than one third are labeled for use in children. And that doesn't mean that we don't use those medications in kids. It just means that we have less information to work with. There are a few mechanisms in place to alert providers to the potential for harm, but they aren't perfect. Electronic records, for example, may include drug interaction alerts, but we know that alert fatigue is real. Because there are so many potential interactions, prescribers are presented with an enormous number of alerts on a daily basis. And when presented with too many warnings, those warnings can stop holding as much meaning. In the community, we have a lot of great pharmacists who want to provide optimal care to pediatric patients. And these are colleagues and friends of mine who I love and respect. But the reality is that not every pharmacist has received the pediatric specific education necessary to understand all of the variables involved in prescribing, especially for children with complexity. Pharmacists 
um, are much more prominent. Uh, pharmacists with additional pediatric training, I should say, are much more prominent in the inpatient hospital setting. But after a patient is discharged, we historically see that pediatric pharmacist presence is lower in the ambulatory setting. And we're left feeling that for providers and caregivers of complex children, medication management in the outpatient setting can feel a bit like the Wild West. So let's go ahead and address our first objective, and that's what do we know about polypharmacy? First, who gets polypharmacy? To answer this question, we studied children exposed to outpatient polypharmacy. We looked at prescription records for more than 240,000 children enrolled in Colorado Medicaid. And this graphic summarizes the results. The horizontal axis shows the number of medications a child was on at once. So that ranges at this bottom axis from one to 10. And the vertical axis shows how many months a child was exposed to that level of polypharmacy. The warmer red and orange colors at the upper right represent those children with high levels of polypharmacy for many months on end. And who are those children who experience those high levels of polypharmacy? Well, we found that looking at this group of children, that older children, those with one or more complex chronic conditions, and those who rely on technology were much more likely to experience high polypharmacy for very long periods of time. Within this group of children with medical complexity, children with neurological conditions are at the highest risk for polypharmacy. In another study of children who use complex medication regimens, we looked at the characteristics of 156 children with medical complexity and polypharmacy. We found that 77% of those children had a significant neurological condition, with a quarter of those children taking 10 or more medications, almost all of them taking one or more high-risk medications, like an opioid pain medicine or a psychoactive medication, and more than a third used compounded medications, which are often challenging to obtain and have other associated safety risks. So why does this level of polypharmacy occur? Well, children with medical complexity, particularly those with neurological conditions, have medical comorbidities that involve many other body systems. I think Sarah and Casey both pointed this out. And this graphic displays the most frequent comorbid diagnoses present when we looked at more than 6,000 children with neurological impairment. And the involvement of multiple body systems can result in the presence of multiple symptoms in real life, which range from life-threatening issues like seizures or respiratory distress to very bothersome symptoms like itching or dry mouth or constipation, all of which frequently require treatment. When we examined parent reported symptoms among 100, and 100 children with neurological impairment and polypharmacy, we found that higher parent reported symptom scores were very significantly associated with higher levels of polypharmacy. Children with the most symptoms were prescribed in excess of 15 to 20 daily medications. We might also think about other aspects of polypharmacy, like when does it begin and where does it occur? And this slide illustrates that it begins very early in life. In this longitudinal study of more than 13,000 United States children with neurological impairment, almost all filled outpatient prescriptions starting in the first year of life, and this persisted throughout their first five years of life. And then what kind of polypharmacy are these children exposed to? Is it just that short-term medications are started and stopped here and there, like an antibiotic for an ear infection or Tylenol for pain? Or is the polypharmacy due to longer-term, more chronic medications? So again, we took a look at prescription records for 4.6 million U.S. children. And we measured whether children were using chronic medications, which we defined as at least 90 days of dispensed medications. Although we looked at children with all types of medical complexity, if we focus in on this slide on the 51,000 children with neurological impairment, more than 60% of those kids used chronic medications with 44% of them using multiple chronic medications. 
And up to this point, we've largely talked about polypharmacy outcomes in terms of total numbers of medications per day. But the story is much more complex when you look at what five or 10 daily medications translates to at the patient level. I think Sarah's picture uh, of her medication table captured uh, that perfectly. Uh, you know, the picture capturing what a thousand words can't display. However, when we examined medication regimen complexity in 123 children with neurological impairment and polypharmacy, we found that median counts per patient were 31 doses, daily doses of medication that a parent needed to administer at home per day, seven different dosing schedules per patient per day. So that could be a daily medicine or a four times a day medicine, but seven different dosing schedules, a median of six different dosage forms per patient. So that could be again, pill form versus liquid form versus a topical medicine. And then five additional specialized instructions above and beyond kind of the usual um, instructions associated with a medication. So you can see that very quickly, this becomes a full-time job for a parent to administer one of these complex medication regimens at home. So at this point, we've hopefully shown just how complex polypharmacy can get, but why does this matter? Well, polypharmacy has implications for patient outcomes and for patient safety. So let's move on to our second objective, which is to recognize some of the types of problems associated with polypharmacy. First, I think it's important to understand that medications can cause adverse drug events or ADEs that result in emergency level care. We looked at 144 million emergency department visits by children to see how frequently this happens. And it happens much more often than we'd like. A half a percent of all annual visits, or roughly 700,000 visits a year, were associated with an adverse drug event related to a medication. And in particular, children with medical complexity had more than five times the risk of an adverse drug event related visit compared to other children. And the implicated drugs were some of the high-risk drugs that we've already spoken about, like psychotropic medications, anti-seizure medications, or pain medications. So why might these adverse drug events happen? Well, certainly it could be due to a medication itself, but we also know that much like in older adults and geriatric patients, Polypharmacy increases the risk of drug-drug interactions, where mixtures of drugs that affect one another can also cause adverse drug events. Going back to that Colorado Medicaid study, we also looked at three risky drug interactions to see whether the level of polypharmacy was related to rates of exposure to these problematic drug interactions. And indeed, the rates of drug-drug interactions increased for children with higher levels of polypharmacy. In this graphic, kids taking 10 or more medications had dramatically higher rates of exposure to these risky drug-drug interactions. And these were only three specific drug interactions that we looked for out of hundreds of different types of drug interactions that are known to occur. For some of these tracer drug-drug interactions, one of the common interactions is that these medicines can stack together to cause side effects like central nervous system depression or anticholinergic effects like dry mouth or constipation. We thus studied whether children with anticholinergic drug-drug interactions actually experienced higher rates of anticholinergic symptoms as reported by their parents. We compared children who took multiple anticholinergic medications with those who took no or single anticholinergic medications. And we discovered that parents were much more likely to report anticholinergic symptoms in children who were taking multiple anticholinergic medications, suggesting that drug interactions have a very real consequence. You can see in this graphic that all of these bothersome symptoms like constipation, dry mouth, uh, urinary problems, all of these things were much more likely in children using multiple anticholinergic medications. 
In another study that Dr. Feinstein briefly introduced a few minutes ago, we attempted to answer the question of just how burdensome these medication regimens can be for the parents who are tasked with keeping it all together. To do this, we used a scoring system called the Medication Regimen Complexity Index, or the MRCI. This system was originally developed for use in adult and geriatric populations, but we found that it also work, works very well for children with polypharmacy. The reason that it works so well is that it captures um, not just medication use, but it captures also how many doses are administered each day, how many differing schedules and dosage forms need to be learned, and how often special tricks like crushing a tablet or opening a capsule might need to be used on a daily basis. What we found out about the 123 children in our study was that severe neurological impairment um, can cause medication regimens that are equal to or more complex than most of the adult populations that have been described. This figure helps to show that because dose frequencies were the primary driver of high MRCI scores, clinical interventions to manage medication complexity might be able to target a number of the different aspects of these regimens that we don't think about that often, such as simplification of dosing schedules. We do know though that there are other aspects of pediatric medication use that can increase complexity and risk for harm. Many of them are things that Sarah described previously for Beckett. Um, for unique patients, we often need unique medications, and sometimes that can come in the form of compounded medications, which do allow for greater flexibility in dosing and administration, but they can also introduce a lot of variability and therefore risk. Liquids are very convenient for children, but anytime that we choose a liquid over a solid dosage form, it results in the potential for calculation or measurement errors, and it requires careful selection of the correct drug concentration at every single transition in care. Many of our patients rely on the use of G-tubes or J-tubes to deliver nutrition and medications, and manipulating medications for such administration isn't always easy or appropriate. There are also some drugs that just might not be absorbed if they're given too far downstream from the stomach, and that detail isn't always considered or researched. And like Beckett, we know that complex children more frequently require supplementation. Um, that could be mineral supplementation to their usual diets or other herbal supplements. And while vitamin and supplement use is common, there's reduced regulatory oversight in these industries that can be concerning. When we put all of those layers of complexity together and we ask parents and caregivers to simply do it all correctly, we know that we're not setting them up for success. And we've seen this come into play. Um, what we saw in this study, which involved over 150 parents of medically complex children, is that parents do feel confident in their abilities to manage their child's home medication regimen. And that's what we want, don't get me wrong we would love for all of our parents to be confident in their understanding of these regimens. But when it came to demonstrating medication abilities, one in four parents were unable to match a medication to its indication, over half were unable to recall dosing parameters for high-risk medications, and nearly half committed errors while measuring liquid doses. And this isn't meant to describe a shortcoming of those parents, but rather it reinforces just how important it is that we improve medication education, especially when polypharmacy is present which leads us to our third objective, what can we do to manage and reduce polypharmacy? For this, I'm gonna revisit the diagram of the medication use system from earlier in the presentation. Each of these steps represents an opportunity. On the right side of the diagram is where I think we've historically made efforts, the most efforts to improve the process. To improve ordering safety, for example, providers typically have access to computerized ordering systems that can alert them of potentially inappropriate doses based on variables like patient weight. We now have e-prescribing systems in which a number of safeguards have been embedded to reduce processing errors, like those that historically used to occur often when transcribing from a paper prescription to a label at the pharmacy. Efforts to standardize dose rounding and dosage form concentrations or to translate prescription instructions to the patient's preferred language have all gone a long way to reduce potential harm during the dispensing phase. But despite these existing safety features, there's still a number of steps that need to be improved. And we know that there are challenges to overcome in order to make an impact. During the prescribing stage, off-label medication use, layered polypharmacy, and unique disease state considerations can greatly complicate the selection of the safest or the most effective medications or doses. So the question is, can we do a better job of generating data to inform our prescribing? I think the answer is hopefully yes, we can. There are currently studies underway, for example, such as this one, 
that attempt to generate improved pharmacokinetic data for drugs that we're already using off-label in kids with high frequency. But we know that there will still likely be gaps and potentially large gaps between the data that results from studies in typically developing children versus those with complex or rare disorders. We see that gap now when attempting to manage common constellations of symptoms, such as self-injurious behavior or even sleep disturbance in children with developmental disorders. Although these disturbances occur at a high frequency, the best available evidence often leaves us wanting with statements like, additional data is needed to better understand stand this troublesome problem, or clinicians must rely upon clinical expertise when managing X, Y, and Z in children. I love our clinicians and their expertise is definitely invaluable, but I would also love to be able to tell them that drug A at dose B would be the best option for a child with whatever symptom the child might have. And we're currently lacking data to get us to that point. So another challenge where we have opportunities to improve is in supporting the home administration of medications. As we pointed out earlier, parents have to function at home as a parent pharmacist, and they be, may be administering many doses of different medications at different times through different routes with extra instructions for certain medications. We need to be able to enhance our ability to support parents. So one way we can do this is to try our best to reduce medication regimen complexity, perhaps by choosing medications with once daily dosing versus multiple times a day dosing. We should also be thinking critically about when opportunities to deprescribe medications uh, exist, like when we might be able to trial a patient off of a medication if they no longer need it or having the symptom that it was initially treating. Second, we have significant opportunities to do a better job at providing better education, tailored advice and instructions that are specific to a patient's unique medication regimen. And this could be done much like it's already done in the care of elderly patients with polypharmacy through periodic meetings with a complex care pharmacist who can provide medication therapy management sessions to really partner with families and proactively address potential issues. Even better is if this could occur with a consistent point of contact, similar to how Sarah mentioned earlier about the trust she has in Beckett's local pharmacists because of their long-term partnership and because their pharmacists know Beckett so well. This could just as easily take place with a continuity pharmacist embedded in a complex care or a primary medical home. And finally, in order to support communication between clinicians and, clinicians and parents, for example, like Sarah said, uh, because they are in a more remote location sometimes, the use of mobile technology and maybe even telehealth encounters for medication therapy management sessions could prove very useful. In fact, we're getting ready to begin a randomized controlled trial of a pharmacist-based intervention to really think about how we can strategize and improve and simplify the complex medication regimens used by children with medical complexity. In addition to traditional outcomes like monitoring for adverse drug events or unplanned acute care visits, our primary focus is really to reduce medication complexity while still effectively partnering with parents and patients to manage or improve their, their symptoms. So stay tuned, uh, there will be more coming in this realm. And finally, let's consider the last step of the prescribing cascade and think about monitoring. So how can we do a better job of working with parents in the home setting to make sure that we are really understanding how a medication is working for the patient and whether there are adjustments that need to be made or other medications that sh we should be trying? And I think Casey spoke to this beautifully at the beginning of the presentation. There needs to be a two-way dialogue um, consistently between uh, parents, caregivers, and the medical team. So how do we do this? Well, one way is to improve our two-way discussion between parents and clinicians so that we can discuss the relevant issues as they come up over time. We have an ongoing study right now to examine whether we can more effectively track parent-reported symptoms after medications are started or changed. And our goal is to detect changes in symptoms in real time so that we can better assess for worsened or improved symptoms. 
To do so, we are using an online symptom tool to track symptoms over time. When providers prescribe a medication of interest, which for this study is a central nervous system related medication, like an anti-seizure medicine or um, an, um, psychoactive medication, parents are automatically sent this symptom inventory at key time points, which is available through the medical record and through their smartphone. And the symptoms can then be tracked over time, for example, to see if a symptom improves. And the information is available in real time to clinicians who can, can make adjustments and react uh, to these, these data. And while we've applied this to the problem of managing medication-related symptoms, this could certainly be applied to other aspects of managing polypharmacy or other aspects of um, children with medical complexity in their care. So before we open it up back to discussion, let's summarize what we've covered uh, over the last 25 minutes. We know that older children with medical complexity particularly those with neurological conditions are at higher risk of prolonged and complex polypharmacy. We've shown you a few examples where polypharmacy has real and measurable downstream safety effects, which emphasizes why we need to be vigilant in thinking about interventions and ways to reduce the risks of polypharmacy. And hopefully by this point, we've got you thinking creatively about other ways that we could improve the management of polypharmacy in particular by addressing issues related to prescribing, uh, how to best support and partner with parents in the home setting, and enhance the monitoring of medications. So where does this leave us? Well, I think we have abundant opportunities to partner to improve medication safety. And the better a job we can do at measuring and understanding medication needs and working with families, the better we can make a response to those needs with interventions, and then monitor whether desired or adverse events are occurring, such that we can really better support parents um, and their children in the home setting. I'll finish by saying that this is a really exciting and fun aspect of patient care to be involved in. We have many opportunities to blend science, creativity, and technology together to improve medication safety in children with medical complexity. And I think we're uh, just at the beginning and I'm excited to discuss this with the group as we finish. So thank you for allowing us to share these ideas with you. If anybody has questions, ideas, or comments uh, that we don't get to during this discussion, you can feel free to reach out to myself and Dr. Orth uh, at the email listed here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Feinstein. Thank you, Dr. Orth, for uh, your presentation. That was excellent. I'm wondering if Sarah and Casey have any comments or thoughts about the presentation. Sure, I would love to add some thoughts. I wrote down a couple of notes as we were going along, and I want to address too in the chat, Christopher made a good point, even just about the timing of medications in patient. You know, for us, we also want them to consider that we travel across a different time zone. So when we return then, making sure that those med times line up as well. I think that with the monitoring process as practitioners are prescribing medications, making a, a specific plan for the next touch point, what to watch for even as it relates to other symptoms. We have an increased challenge in Beckett's life because he does not use words to communicate. So we've got to look for other things. And perhaps that also means that we use laboratory or things like that um, to like check a liver enzyme instead of monitoring for stomach discomfort. I think that the question too of, is this med helping? You know, sometimes I answer that the only way I know is if it's taken away. Um, and we learn a lot of wisdom through our journey. Like in our life was that question came up a lot with Baclofen. And once he had the pump, we really saw the benefit of Baclofen in his life. And I think the last thing that I'll just, um, a couple things, the pharmacy working with insurance to avoid multiple trips to the pharmacy mm -hmm. so that most of the meds or all of the meds can maybe be dispensed at one time for pickup rather than 29 times for us. And then lastly, I wanna empower our practitioners to also think about how to help parents teach some levels of self-administration as age appropriate. For us, Beckett, it has control of his Flintstone vitamin <laughs> and his consent in taking it. Um, but there are ways that we can start, start to integrate 
Beckett or any child into um, their life living with medication. Thanks for your thoughts today. Thanks, Sarah. Casey, do you have any comments? Yeah, I think um, I, I think Sarah kind of summed them up, and I, I completely agree. While um, my sister is not, you know, medically fragile, she does have a lot of the same needs and uh, situations that we go through, right? And I think one of the biggest, um, you know, takeaways from this is really kind of like we said earlier, is being a team. And one of the other things that Sarah said is about, you know, is this medication working? Or in her case, right, has it worked in the past? What have you seen? What was the reaction? What was the result? There's also a ceiling sometimes where it just bottoms out, right? And we see that. Those are the kind of proactive questions that we want to see because honestly, sometimes because we're juggling so much, sometimes we may forget. Like I said, there's a laundry list that we have had, that we have, and that we will receive in the future. Um, so, you know, right now, neurologically, we are having a tr hard trouble with her sleeping. And that's because everything that she has, she's at, she's bottomed out, right? Nothing works um, in reference to her managing rest because her ups and downs are so elevated when it comes to what her mood swings look like. And um, I think those are the type of questions that we need. It's not always about um, the milligrams, right? It's not always about how much or how less. Does it actually work? Did we actually see positive or negative results when we began or stopped taking this, um, you know, this prescribed medication? So um, again, working as a team, ensuring that everyone understands the process and where we're headed to, why and why we think that this is the right um, avenue to go down for this individual. And then of also making sure that if of age, like my sister, has the ability to advocate for themselves to ensure that we're also hearing their voice. Because, you know, nothing about me without me is a true statement in this situation. And I think that needs to also be, you know, put here and addressed as well, that they have to be an equal party when talking about medications. My son is nine years old and he's already been, you know, a part of his pediatric visits, right? Saying what hurts, what doesn't hurt, his IEP meetings when he's in school, understanding how he needs that support in school as well. So again, collectively as a team, I think we can definitely go together and see a positive outcome in these type of situations. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. We're going to now move on to the discussion portion of the seminar with our panelists, um, with all four of our panelists, and address some of the questions and comments that are coming in. And a reminder, um, the session will be extended until 2.30. You're welcome to stay on for this discussion. For those who need to drop off, uh, please come and join us again at our next session, which is on a topic very related to this. It's gonna be about sleep, um, which is on, on April 14th. And uh, it's with Carolyn, Dr. Carolyn Okery, uh, Dr. Shelley Weiss, Sarah Perkins and uh, Sandra Gilbert will be leading that session. Um, and uh, also a reminder to those uh, in today's seminar uh, who have to drop off if, uh, to complete your evaluation by uh, Monday, March 21st to get your CME. So we have some great questions. I'm gonna start um, asking the panel. The first question um, actually came from the chat um, and it's uh, from Lauren. And then she had a nice follow-up question as well. Um, where did the number five come up for polypharmacy? Cause I would imagine um, uh, even, uh, you know, a complex regimen of three or four medications could be uh, construed as polypharmacy. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, truly, polypharmacy is uh, two or more medications, and those two or three or four medications could be very complex um, in themselves. We have uh, relied on that five cutoff by looking um, at both kind of geriatric and adult studies uh, where we've started to see kind of a rise in problems uh, after that kind of level of five medications. I mean, we've actually found that in the pediatric population um, that plays out um, in work that we've done uh, looking at children's medication regimens and then kind of downstream problems from those medication regimens. It's certainly not fixed, um, but it's it's a good starting point. And uh, a second question from Lauren, who said she had to leave at two o'clock because her daughter um, has a Q2 hourly medication regimen. So very apropos for today's discussion. 
Her question is, what can family caregivers do about EPIC systems, so electronic medical record systems that don't account for drug-drug interactions um, uh, when the patients uh, are in healthcare encounters? Uh, so patient-facing great... portals. That's a great question. Um, and it really, on the inpatient side, the, the point in time when this alert would occur is really only at the time that the, the medication is being ordered. Um, so the provider may get an alert, the, the verifying pharmacist may get an alert. But beyond that time, medications can be moved around on the administration record, and you may no longer have access to a known interaction. Um, and so I think that's where pharmacy can really come into play and having pediatric trained pharmacists on all of the care teams can be helpful to kind of navigate the timing of those medications. And I would just empower those pharmacists to really try to be more active in their education of nurses for important events like that. If you know that one medication can absorb, uh, affect the absorption of another, um, you may not see that alert again after it's verified. So having a pharmacist involved in retiming of medications and empowering education of, of bedside nurses and providers about those issues can be important. Yeah, and that's something that from a parent's perspective too, I think it's um, very empowering to, to ask, uh, you know, if you're joining family-centered rounds, uh, if there is a pharmacist um, for that inpatient team that could help kind of think about the medication regimens that you know, that child is being exposed to. Um, I think that that's a, always a very valid uh, question to ask. Sarah Casey, anything you want to add? I think one of the things that has happened in some of Beckett's inpatient stays is they have to scan every med with the, his like name badge. And that's when some of those alarms could come up as well as mm, warning can't give in conjunction with this. Yeah, that's a good point of a way that we could improve our informatics systems. Um, like right now, if a nurse scans a medication and it's too soon to be given, they'll receive an alert about that. Um, so incorporating drug interactions into those alerts when they have been known to be given within X number of hours could be a bonus on the, on the informatics side that can be improved. Um, I would just say in our experience, just make sure that that information is up to date, right? And tell you how many times we've had expired medication show up and I have had to fight <laughs> back and forth that this is not, um, you know, it's no longer, you know, appropriate to give or she's no longer taking that or, you know, whatever. So um, I think that happens constantly more than anything that I've seen as far as affecting us, you know, in, in reference to treatment is, is not is ensuring that all medications are within those systems up to date. Yeah, and I will kind of make a final question or statement about that, that totally agree. And then, um, you know, the information about interactions is only as good as kind of we have it for children, um, which, as Dr. Orth pointed out during the presentation, uh, is pretty thin and scant for a lot of medicines that we use um, in children. So um, we have to work as a clinical community to really uh, improve and make sure that we are responding and providing alerts to medications that really need to be um, alerted and then trying to weed out uh, the noise for lots of other things that may be kind of red herrings. Yeah. Yeah, and that can, that can look very different for uh, a, a patient, a pediatric patient that has few comorbidities and few medications. Some of those potential interactions, for example, might, might impact that patient much more drastically than an interaction that we know exists for a patient with medical complexity, but that we have to work around just because we know that both of these drugs are needed and, and we deal in some way with the interaction that exists and, and make it work for us. We have lots of other great questions coming through. I'm gonna ask the next one, which is a hard one, I think. How could we advocate, and I think this is on the level of uh, pharma, for improved design of medications? So, but they're given less frequently during the course of the day, more amenable to giving through alternative routes like a feeding tube, have clear instructions, infographics, where it shows interactions and cautions with common medication that patients are already on. 
Yeah, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development um, actually has an initiative called the Best um, Pharmaceuticals for Children Act. And this is um, something that is directed exactly to this, um, where they are tasked with taking medicines that have been used in other populations, adult uh, populations, for example, and really doing um, the work necessary to figure out whether those medications um, that we use off-label in pediatrics currently can be relabeled with pediatric specific indications based on new data. So I think that the FDA has had, um, and Luke, you can correct me, I, I think that they have made um, label changes for um, close to a hundred medications uh, that have been it's actually, um, we're up to 550 label changes since 2003 wow. um, that have been a result of that and one other legislative act. So this is, again, taking um, medicines that we have traditionally used as pediatricians off-label and providing much um, clearer guidance around their use that is backed up by real-world studies that we have you know, subsequently done in pediatric populations. Yeah, not directly to answer this question, but somewhat similar, and the feeding tube aspect is certainly relevant here. Uh, I think that we need to make a push as a community to encourage the FDA to require more transparency from the manufacturers within their product labeling. Um, I worked on a recent project where we were looking at what medications or how long a refrigerated medication can be out at room temperature before it's no longer safe to use. Um, and we found that for about 600 meds, uh, that information is not publicly available. And so you can call the manufacturer to ask for that, that detail. Sometimes they require you to provide an an, a specific patient case before they'll, they'll answer whether the drug is still usable. Um, so that type of information that we know is or is not being studied, we need to encourage that it has to be studied and that it has to be made transparent for providers. Same thing with feeding tubes and sites of absorption. Um, we know that the, the science exists to determine what can be administered to the jejunum versus the gastric site. So making that information transparent and readily available is important. I will just add that I think that involvement of the family voice or self-advocates is also pretty critical to any level of advocacy. We certainly don't wanna burden only families with this job because it really starts with the practitioner of really understanding those medications and what the needs are for families so they can best, best represent it. But like Dr. Feinstein, the, the group that you talked about, I would challenge that group to make sure that there is a self-advocate or parent involved in some of those discussions because it is about those voices being represented as well. I feel the same Move way. Up. I'm sorry, I'm just saying, I'm just echoing. I feel the same way. It's it's very pertinent that we have, you know, the family voice at the, at the forefront because it's, you know, the involvement is crucial. Without them, you're not going to get the correct information that you need to even service the patient. So, I'm going to move to the next question from Christopher Russell. Um, are there best practices for incorporating pharmacists into clinics or having pharmacists only visits, potentially using telehealth to minimize the burden of travel for families? Sounds like you guys are doing pretty awesome stuff in Colorado. Is that best practices? Uh, we're, we're trying to, to show that it's best practice. I think we've got, um, in the ambulatory care setting, the data really starts in the adult population for managing conditions with guideline-driven approaches to treatment, like heart failure and diabetes and asthma. Um, and we're slowly seeing that information make it into ambulatory care settings in pediatric settings. So. We often have a pharmacist in a cystic fibrosis clinic or in a transplant clinic. But in the primary care setting, historically, that has been pretty limited. I don't think there's many pharmacists around the country that work in primary care. When they do, they're typically found in complex care clinics, but they're not found in every complex care clinic. And, and Dr. Feinstein and I are hoping that our research will at least show that, that there is a significant benefit to having a pharmacist in those settings so that it can become the best practice. It is a really um, substantial benefit uh, to all parties involved in taking care of children. Um, we have had so much feedback from the families that come to our clinic 
that they love partnering with pharmacy during the course of a usual well child visit or a standard follow up visit and having a pharmacist who is there like Dr. Orth to um, know the history of their child's medications, be able to kind of talk about the current state of those medications and then make um, some very well informed partnership discussions with the families to kind of think about where we go from there. Um, clinicians, I can say from my side of the table, uh, we uniformly love partnering with embedded pharmacists because um, this is something that um, I think for a lot of clinicians is is been traditionally in, in our court to manage, um, but sometimes uh, we feel you know outside of our bounds of knowledge and being able to partner with pharmacists and kind of also um, hear parents and patients' uh, views on how things are going is just, it's been uh, really invaluable. Yeah, and in, in turn, the pharmacists, in my experience, I'm, I'm so reliant on the caregivers um, to be able to provide their story, provide me their history. Uh, Casey, it really spoke to me when you, you talked about the, the challenges of managing sleep. Um, Oftentimes we have sleep medications or other medications that are prescribed by multiple subspecialties and people don't really feel comfortable taking away a drug that, that they're not managing. So having some type of centralized point of contact, like we talked about in the presentation, um, that can help guide those conversations to the subspecialists when they need to be involved and say, hey, we've got these three sleep meds. Um, they're, they're not really providing benefit at this point. We'd like to start slowly taking one or two of them away and see we can always stop the dose where, where it becomes apparent that it is no longer providing benefit. We can keep it on board or add it back. But we have to start thinking about ways we can reduce polypharmacy in many cases. Um, and that really relies upon the parents being involved. There's a question from yeah. Sarah Wilkerson about handling um, medications. Uh, as, as this is, I think, a question for Luke from a pharmacy perspective. How do you all handle uh, pharmacies compounding to non-standard concentrations? That's a big challenge. Um, I think we we all recognize in this discussion the values that having compounded drugs can add. Um, there's a lot of medications that are beneficial that just aren't commercially available in ways that we would like. There are some states that are leading the initiative on this. Michigan, I think, was the first state to really push its, its independent compounding pharmacies to develop standardized concentrations that are consistent across all compounding pharmacies. Um, there is a, a large pharmacy organization called the American, System, American Society of Health Systems Pharmacy that is kind of uniting an interprofessional effort right now uh, called Standardized for Safety, where we're looking at commonly used pediatric outpatient meds and inpatient meds and coming out up with a, a standard concentration that would be able to be measured in the ways that we need to measure it and safe to use so that no matter what hospital you go to, your epinephrine infusion is going to be the same concentration across the board to prevent errors. Or anytime you go to a compounding pharmacy, you're getting the same concentration of compounded clonidine so that the inpatient hospital setting, they can rely upon the mom who simply knows that they give four milliliters, then, then we know what amount of micrograms that is uh, and we don't commit an error that could be egregious. Maybe I'll, I have a question for you guys. As a moderator, I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna take my poetic license to ask my own question. How, how much do we actually know about drug-drug interactions when we're starting to talk about this degree of polypharmacy? Like, um, do we know how 11 different drugs interact with each other in a meaningful way? Is there an opportunity in a world where we are much better at data science and um, finding relations between things that people didn't think of, drug, 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 G2, um, et cetera, that uh, might affect um, the uptake and metabolism and adverse drug events associated with, with, with drugs? Yeah, that's a great question, Al. So, you know, to date, most, if not all, of the drug-drug interaction studies that have been done, at least in pediatrics, mm -hmm. uh, have looked at two drug combinations um, in isolation from the other medications that may be present in that child's life. Um, 
once you start getting above the two and three drug combinations, it becomes technically very challenging to do. And also um, it becomes very difficult to tease out which medicine is doing what when one medicine may increase uh, the dose of another medicine that may be um, kind of has its effects decreased by another medicine. So to really follow a story of how one medication is affected by 10 other medications is um, very, very complex. Um, I hope that our data scientists will be able to uh, help us kind of move that forward in the future. But to your point, uh, I think we have a, a limited understanding of what drug-drug interactions truly manifest as in real life. Yeah, to me, to me, there's kind of two categories of drug interactions that I think about. One of them is just overlapping side effects and toxicity. Uh, so things like sedating medications, we don't necessarily always know that there's some type of uh, genetic or genomic component that's causing one drug to be increased in concentration. But we know that there's more sedation when you add more sedative medications. And we don't know if it's linear. We don't know if adding the seventh drug that can cause CNS depression is going to tip us into the unsafe area. Um, same thing with like anticholinergic side effects or serotonergic toxicity. There's other interactions where, for instance, CYP enzymes. Um, we know that if one medication is an inhibitor of an enzyme, then another medication that relies on that enzyme can be effective or affected. I think that that's the area where we have more knowledge now, and it seems to be the area where we're rapidly gaining more knowledge through things like the Human Genome product, Project. Um, we're expanding beyond the CYP enzymes and learning about other transporters and enzymes and receptors and how those come into play. It seems like every month there's something new to learn in that area, but really like the, the overlapping side effects question, I, that's something I think is important to explore. Yeah, some of uh, our, my colleagues in genetics comment on that we are entering an era where genomics is not just about diagnostics, but much more going to be around tailored therapeutics. And I think this is an area that's ripe for work. Uh, there's certainly examples of it, but but in the context of polypharmacy in particular, really important. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'll just follow up by saying we yeah. have um, we have a special needs psychiatrist uh, embedded within our clinic who has been using um, the psychotropic uh, kind of genotyping panels for psychotropic medicines um, to some degree uh, in our population of children. And I think that that's kind of where we're seeing the majority of work push forward right now. But as Dr. Worth pointed out, hopefully that will be available for other um, parts of the body and other body systems. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd like to um, read a comment from uh, from Chris Russell again, which I think is um, Im important, I think is a good point, uh, launching point for a discussion. Um, can we talk a little bit about de-escalation and the concept of de-escalation of medications? And, and Dr. Russell also brings up the idea of de-escalation of other interventions we do, such as uh, complex feeding regimens. Um, is there a way we can think about opportunities in our clinical encounters to really hone in on this as an opportunity to have a discussion about or, or a review of everything to say is every single thing we are doing at the moment absolutely necessary or is it causing either harm or a lot of inconvenience and in, uh, for families uh, in terms of the interventions that we recommend potentially even a trial for change and see if 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 things things uh, change based on that Sarah or Casey, I wonder if one of you might want to start that discussion from your perspective. Well, I think for me, it, it goes back to really evaluating what are the goals, because I think sometimes um, having a stable life is okay to just hold on to for a little bit, um, depending on the needs of the child or what um, critical moments they've had in the recent past. But I think that starting that discussion um, with the practitioners about here are things that I see. Is this something that you want to try? Um, opens up the family's ability to advocate for, no, I don't want to address that. Um, like for Beckett, um, he continues to have like between 20 and 50 seizures a day. Um, but we 
And I, I know that seems alarming, but we say we're not, we're okay with not treating these because they're a second long and he's not really affected by them. So we don't really wanna add a sixth seizure medication knowing what side effects that might have. So being involved in those decisions, I think is the critical um, juncture and, and, and having that, that choice making be really left upon the family. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, that those are hard decisions. And like, like you heard me say before, um, you know, we have um, been struggling with, with sleep, right? And, and that's something like we, we can't not address, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, and, and like I said, I'll reiterate, she's really bottomed out of a lot of different um, medication. So, so what is the next step, right? Um, so we tried alternative um, medications, alternative therapies, um, where we've also, you know, considered, um, you know, medical marijuana for, for her to, to sleep, right? Um, and having that support to, is this something that we should do? How is this going to work with current medications? Um, you know, wh where do we go? you know, even if there's not a question that can be answered, what direction do we go in to answer these questions? Because what is it that we actually do? So knowing, even if it's something that it's not normally practiced, knowing that you have not, I wouldn't even say the backup, but knowing that you have, you know, the interest from your physician that this is something that you want to do, the discussion is okay to be had, or it can be an open discussion without even feeling, um, you know, judged about those decisions, right? Because at the end of the day, I have to come back to you um, or, you know, decide to go to someone else new. And who wants to do that after building a rapport with the, with, with the team that you already have? So having those open discussions that may be hard um, unless uh, without leaving it completely up to the family, um, I think, again, it's it's just pertinent that you do, because it's not always going to be a yes, 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 yes. It's going to be a no. It's going to be a decision. It's going to be a discussion, a negotiation. Um, all of those things are taken into consideration, right? And I think we have to really look at what's happening, what's really, really happening versus um, what has happened in other cases, what's the possibility, but really actually what's happening in the individual's life. I think that having the right time and setting to do that, uh, kind of with a team that has continuity of care with families and with patients is really important. Um, you know, oftentimes we make changes in the hospital uh, because there's something acute happening and that doesn't necessarily get transmitted to the outpatient setting very well where the longer term follow-up happens or it may not include kind of the outpatient providers who know that family and those patients um, you know, over a long time where they may be able to offer additional insights about what has worked in the past, what hasn't worked, uh, so that kind of current decisions to pull back a medicine or trial off of a medicine um, kind of aren't brand new if, if they've already been tried or approached. But again, I think it's, um, Casey, as you pointed out, having those teams and having people that you have relationships with over a great deal of time who know you well um, is just it's key to approaching these types of decisions to start and stop new medicines and i know like you know <clears throat> so so my sister is, is is a little older right but you know she she was a you know she was a, a, a youth at one point right um and we worked with our pediatrician until we couldn't work with him anymore right so we took him all the way to, I believe it's like 23 or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, someone has to do that transition. Someone, it has to be smooth. A lot of families are out there just kind of like, okay, well, we're done with the pediatric process, you know, the pediatric time. Now we have to find an adult physician and that own piece, right? is so pertinent there to where that handoff process is, is needed and necessary to, to the right team, right? So that we can continue to um, work in alignment of what he or she needs. Um, and one day it will happen to all of us, right? Um, so that those close relationships are very, very um, important because I'm, I'm going to tell you, my sister, she if she doesn't know you, it's going to take a nice time 
to start over again and you know just kind of having that before that transition time happens and having that team already set in place makes a huge difference for the individual and the family and of course the, the physician because you don't you know who wants to see a 30 year old in a, in a pediatric office <laughs> I think that that relationship that Casey talks about is so important too, because it's also okay to challenge things when you have trust, like the example of you have done such a great job. Look at how much your child has grown. Let's talk about these J feedings and maybe we can try something else, right? Um, that it's not just about challenge for the sake of challenge, that it's about celebrating some of the successes that the child and family are having. Yeah, I think, I think. Go ahead, Luke. Sorry, uh, the one thing I wanted to mention with with the thought of deprescribing is that we, there's ways that we can hurt ourselves and make it fail. Um, a lot of times we think about things like drug withdrawal for for medications that cause dependence, and that's at the forefront of people's minds. But there's other medications that we could see rebound symptoms and think that we we failed because they can't go without that medication when actually we just use the inappropriate strategy. So things like proton pump inhibitors, um, if you cut that off cold, cold turkey, we know that rebound hyper acid hypersecretion exists and, and those patients are gonna experience more severe symptoms, but kind of planning what that this de-escalation plan will look like appropriately with regard to dosing and discontinuation um, can really at least set us up for the most successful possibility. And it, it may still not work, but we can always add that medication back if needed. So I'd like to um, end with just a, a reflection of what I've learned listening to the four of you today. Um, just a few key learnings for myself. Uh, clearly, this is a really important area for families, for clinicians, for the system. Uh, uh, it needs creative strategies. Uh, it needs co-leadership together with caregivers who really are anchored in, in a lived experience and, and, and really are essential for any co-design of anything that will be effective uh, in, 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 in managing uh, polypharmacy. Like you can't talk about deep prescribing without actually working with the end user. Um, also lots of reflections on areas of, 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 of knowledge that, um, uh, are needed and, and it's great to hear the research that your team is, is leading uh, to move that forward. And lastly, uh, that critical advocacy piece about roles of pharma. I, I, I'm fortunate to work in a place that has a pharmacist embedded in our complex care team. And I can concur that it is invaluable to the work we do. Um, I almost think as pharmacy is like its own subspecialty. It's like uh, uh, it's, it's that, like a medical subspecialty that I rely on. I couldn't do the work that I do without uh, the incredible uh, knowledge uh, and experience and skills that pharmacists have. And um, really looking forward to the results of your trial uh, to help move that forward. So on that note, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and special thank you to all our panelists. A reminder again to complete your surveys and please join us again uh, April 14th. We have a great session on, on sleep uh, and uh, you're all gonna receive registration by email uh, for that session. So on behalf of um, the rest of us in the C6 uh, team, uh, really thank you everybody for joining today. Thank you.